So as a quick heads up, I hope in the future we have a switch and we have a roundtable of different hosts joining. I'm sure that we'd like refreshing new voices to take on hosting duties. But I'm Jen. I lead up the social and content side here at Mistin, And I'm pleased to present our lovely Mistin Move programming team. I would love it if people would first do a round of introductions of their names and a background of, you know, how you got into the Move program programming language, maybe even some highlights of proud accomplishments that you've achieved in this space. Let's start with you, Adam. Hi, my name is Adam Malk. I, I'm actually probably the most junior member of the, maybe outside of the mere official, uh, but he, everybody has a larger experience with the MOOC language than myself. I really started working with it or on it in January when I joined the company, the rest of the labs. I have a fair amount of experience implementing, optimizing programming languages in general. I don't know if I had any huge achievements already. I definitely worked on, I think we did all a pretty reasonable job in enhancing the ES Code plugin that we have for Move, And now it has a lot more features that kind of makes this a bit more convenient programming tool for you know our lovely book developers so i guess that's the best is from me don't be shy i'm Zemir, the author of the move book and as of today also author of the syntax package which i mean we got move syntax highlighting on github so everyone can now enjoy move files being highlighted i got into move like kind of against my will because my cto said that this is going to be our language that we're going to use and so I was like, all right, I need to know it. And then, yeah, of course, I fell in love. It was how many, three years ago. It was 2019. Still there, still doing something. Yep. I'll go next if you're finished. So my name is Emma. The first time I started working on Move was when I was an intern at the Move team at Meta on Facebook back then in 2019. After the internship, I really liked the team and the language. So I decided to join full time when I graduated in 2020. So I've been working on Move full time since then. It's been about two years. My contribution to Move is mostly around the Move over. If you have read our papers, you will see my name on it on the two papers that we have. and. I also defined and verified a lot of the, the move code in DM framework. So right now I'm continuing this work, adapting our move to approval to Sway Move together with Adam and writing all the contracts in our Sway framework. What I like most about our move the language is how we enforce safety at the bytecode level uh, instead of at source code level. I think that really helps add another layer of protection. So are you going to mention the empty struts today? You want me to talk about empty struts? Yeah, I, I really want you to talk about it. All right, I'll make that way fun fact. I had a different fun fact, but I think I used the other fun fact actually the last time I did one of these things. Soon, but it's possible. Hello, Todd. I've been on this team since, or since 2018. I was like the third or fourth person on the project. Joined the same week as the guy who wrote the VM, uh, Dart. And uh, yeah, I've been doing all sorts of things. Wrote the source language compiler. I've been doing kind of integration work here on Mistin recently. In terms of fun facts, my fun fact is always, at least with SWE Move, is that Move was originally an object-oriented language with classes and things, methods, and another funness. Uh, that we got rid of that for modules, and it's just always amusing to me that we're back to objects. However, our objects now are very different than the first for another move. So yeah. it's been a kind of a crazy, it was a very bumpy ride in the first few months, as any, I think, new language will have. Uh, Demir wants me to talk about empty structs. So that is also a sort of fun thing in the VM of. Oh, let's keep it, let's keep it. Don't tell me. You don't want me to tell it now. Let's just wait a bit. We need to okay. keep track. Fine. I'll tell it later. We're trying to keep an air of mystery, apparently. So I, I can do that. Yes. Okay. And then we'll close this intro out with you, Sam. I'm Sam. I'm the creator of Move and work on the language since the spring of 2018. Done, worked in a variety of areas of Move over the years: design, implementation, formalization, and writing research papers about the prover and analysis. Uh, look at making the language cross-platform instead of just specific to DM. Building out the team and working with folks to trying to get aligned on a cohesive vision for what Move should be. My fun fact about the language is that the original name of the prototype was Tulip, which was this very cheeky name for the, the sort of object, the more uh, object-oriented class method version. Of it that we first showcased to the DM team, but this name was very wisely rejected. The DM Novi leadership is being not a good branch for that project, and so uh, we had to pivot and came up with the name Move, which is a much better name anyway. Fun fact, uh, or a favorite uh, thing about Move that you wanted to share, not to not to put you on the spot, but, uh, and Demir, I think you got away without doing it as well. Yeah, th for people who did not share their fun facts, so this was this was a miss from me. Please share some fun facts so that our lovely community can also figure out like what gets you hooked into this language. Can you imagine people are like going crazy about this new language, which is called Tulip? 
I mean, I have. Yeah, it seemed like it had a nice logo. I have theories on that. If you think about the whole crisis that the Netherlands went through with the tulip bubble, and considering like we were in a bear market, I think it's a very wise thing we didn't have tulip because there's just a lot of comparisons that can come from that particular naming and branding. Yeah, that was good. the Dutch tulip crisis was indeed the uh, the cheeky origin of the name. Yeah, we're program language theorists, not branding experts on that. Okay. Thank you for the intros. I know that there were a lot of questions that came through. So being mindful of the time constraints that I know that everyone is facing. And also, once again, thank you so much to the community for tuning in and as always being highly engaged and giving us such great questions for the teams to dive into. We will go straight in and also monitor, once again, our Twitter spaces as well as our Discord events chat just to see if there's additional questions that pop up in the event that we do have extra time at the end to include them. So. Without further delay, would love to dive into our first set of questions. The first one that we have is, you know, what makes Move language different from other programming languages? And really, what are its characteristics that make it I mean, I think uh, what we wanted to designate, so I'll kind of play facilitator moderator in this is, uh, you know, Emma and Adam, if you could dive into the specific question. Uh, let's start with you, Emma. Yeah. So Move Language was started like around mid 2018. And shortly after that, the photo verification project for the Move Language was also started. So our language really was built with like, verifiability in mind. And I think it really shows in a lot of the design decisions we have made. And it also shows by the fact that we have our move prover and our DM framework fully specified just one year after the launch of the language. I think that really separates us apart from other languages. Normally the languages exist first and then later when it becomes more popular, people start formally verifying it. So I feel like that's one unique thing about move. I can pick it up and then yeah, I can think of other things as well. I can give you a bit of a newbie perspective because everybody else has been working on the language since, you know, 2019. And in my case, it is only six months. I think what's unique about MILF is that I think it brings kind of interesting things from the world of programming smart contracts, which has been done, you know, in other contexts, like, you know, other actually smart contract languages around other than Solidity. But it also brings some very interesting concepts from kind of more traditional programming languages. And so, for example, the way the assets are encoded in MILF is different than, you know, it's to be traditionally done as far as I understand, at least, and languages that have been used to programs like complex, like Solidity. Uh, so we have this kind of rich or richer way of specifying properties of assets. And every type that you create and move is, is essentially an NFT uh, with like, you know, the rich properties that you can modify and change and stuff like that. There is also this notion of code reuse and being able to share what you've written, you know, with different people that are writing smart contracts. So that is kind of tough to do in the traditional, like in Solidity and, and other languages that are more traditionally used in blockchains. And Move has been designed around this concept of being able to share code easily. So that's why we have this concept of packages and modules that, you know, you write it, you publish it, you publish source code somewhere that people kind of know what they're seeing on the chain. But then, you know, you don't have to kind of copy and paste, write the same code over and over again. You can just kind of reuse what other people have written in the past. I think this is something that has brought in from more traditional programming languages. And as Emma said, there is this kind of notion of, of the language being both expressive enough, but also kind of in some sense minimal enough that it helps helps with finding bugs and writing tools that will help you automatically find bugs, which some of them exist, like the prover, and some of them will be written in the future, let's hope. So that's kind of my take on this. Well, if we're diving into the next question, does anyone else also want to chime in? I can add that most expressivity is one of the greatest features and like well, what what's really outstanding about the language because if we look at like even our contract implementations and examples, escrow contract is 70 lines, so roughly like a hundred lines of comments for uh, like a coin is a seven line there, which we recently showed a few weeks ago. And so it is crazy that you don't need to write much code. You just go straight into business logic of your application, your module, and you got everything. That's a really great addition, Damir. Thank you. What we also dive into is I think we, we're starting to see this question also pop up quite a bit, which is, pardon my language, why the hell can't you just use Rust? It's an amazing language. More importantly than that, why can't the industry just settle on standards for the greater good? So that's kind of something that's been prevailing overall. We're hearing a lot about Rust come up, move as a language, but also standardization. Sam, do you have some thoughts on that? 
Yes, absolutely. I mean, the short answer to this question is that we tried. When I first joined the Libra project, we didn't set out to create a new language. We started off by, I actually joined the Libra project because I was previously working on static analysis and trying to make programs correct by having tools that ran on top of existing languages without changing them and tried to find bugs. But I was so inspired by the design of Rust specifically and being able to find data races uh, and prevent them at compile time instead of doing it after the fact via a static analyzer like I was. That I was like, man, this language design thing is way more influential but then static analysis. I was like, yeah, I should try that out and see what other things we could do. So when I joined Libra, I was very into Rust and, you know, looked at the type system and said, this has this nice move semantics, this nice ownership semantics that's baked in. If you look at these smart contracts, they have ownership as a, a very key concept. It would be great if we could Rust as a great tooling, as a great ecosystem, and as great developers. It would be really great if we could use Rust. This makes a ton of sense. So when we looked into that, what we found was basically this won't work, not because Rust isn't a great language, but because Rust is a source language. And in these blockchain platforms, what runs on the blockchain isn't source code, it's bytecode. You can't have the Rust compiler being run whenever you try to publish your code on chain. It's a big, expensive piece of software, and it's going to take a long time to run. What you want is a really compact bytecode format that you execute directly and that doesn't have to run or be compiled. So there, there is no such thing as Rust bytecode. When you run your Rust code, it goes through LLVM, it gets compiled to machine code. You can't just publish machine code directly on the blockchain because some attacker might directly publish machine code and then that, that doesn't have the nice guarantees of Rust or any other source language and that it'll do malicious things with your code. You really need a bytecode language that has the guarantees of something like Rust but is safe and then as Emma was mentioning before like you can check the things that you care about directly out the bytecode and do it cheaply having to go through a compiler. So we were very much inspired by Rust initially had the idea to use Rust but then we realized like you can't do this because of this constraint about the executable format. And beyond that there's a variety of other things too where languages are inherently somewhat application specific right? Like otherwise we just have one programming language that's everything, but Rustin's great for writing a little system software, but you know, it's not what you use to program on the web. Like that's JavaScript because it has the DOM baked in, like everything in web programming is about being able to show things that are happening on the website and move stuff around and be very dynamic. So solar contracts are a very, very different application domain system software that Rust targets, or from even other domains we've seen before. There are certain kinds of abstractions and certain safety guarantees that you need that you don't have elsewhere. So it makes a lot of sense to have a language that's purpose-built with these things in mind, but then inherits the good design characteristics from something like Rust. And so that's exactly what we tried to do with Move, is to take a lot of the good ideas, particularly the borrow checker, like the ownership type system, the way references work, and then bring in things that are put our own smart contract you spin on it, bring in things like the ability system, which lets you control their types can be copied, whether they can be dropped, whether they can exist in global storage which there's no baked in notion of global storage in a language like Rust. So basically like every time I hear this question, it makes me a little bit sad because we love Rust, Move is implemented Rust, everything else we do at SWE is implemented Rust. And we in fact tried to use it first. The fact is there's just a fundamental difference between a source language that's designed to be a general purpose systems programming language and a smart contract language that has an executable bytecode representation that has the, the safety guarantees that you want. And the second part of this question is why can't the industry just align on, you know, one standard? We totally agree with that part. And that's what we're trying to do with Move. The, the status quo of smart contract language which is, is that you have something like Solidity or the EVM where it overfits with so many implementation details of the underlying platform that you basically can only use it on that platform. You can use it on Ethereum or you can use it on chain for EVM clones. And if someone starts a new blockchain today, they typically come up with a new language just for that platform. And then when someone else comes along and creates another platform, you can't use that language anymore. So this makes it super hard to align an industry standard and build out a cohesive community, a tooling, libraries, all the stuff that make a programming language great. I mean, we've designed it so that it doesn't, by construction, it does not overfit any sort of blockchain implementation details. Move itself doesn't know about things like accounts or transactions or cryptography or that stuff. It's just very, very simple. So it's easy to take it and put it into blockchain platforms that look very different in the hood. So we're actually actively trying to solve that problem with Move. And I think there's some early signs that we're being very successful. There's side different blockchains that are using Move and they'll look quite different under the hood in terms of how they set their transaction formats, how they do storage, how they do account structure, how the consensus works. We very much sympathize with the ask of the question. I think uh, we're moving along these lines. Got it. And, you know, as an extension, actually, before we go into something that kind of extends on this, are there other kind of additions to this from the wider team? I think what convinced me and everything, obviously, there's some stuff that makes a lot of sense, but the two things that convinced me that you can't really use a traditional programming language easily on, on, the, on the blockchain is they haven't been designed or implemented with determinism in mind. So what normally blockchains require, if you need to be able to deterministically replay computations, those languages just won't work right off the box. And the other one, have been implemented with gas mirroring in mind. So if you need to figure out how much your computations cost, you can charge, you know, on the blockchain for the computation. Again, this is just not something that traditional programming languages do. So adopting uh, one of them would be really difficult. 
basically in everything that was said, another question that kind of extends on this is, you know, why is move based on rust? I know that there was affection that you spoke about, Sam, but beyond the affection for rust as a language for source code, is there a reason why move was based on it? Or is that a misconception? I think based on is a little bit too strong, but I think it's certainly strongly influenced by Rust and particularly by the ownership type system and the so-called borrow checker where there's a distinction between passing a type that where a function is going to take ownership of it versus asking for a beautiful reference. Very, very much influenced by Rust. I think any language going forward, whether it's inside the smart contract space or outside, should take a very careful look at the borrow checker and think about it. It's just a huge advance in having memory management without garbage collection and still being safe that anyone who's a language designer needs to pay careful attention to. In terms of the syntax as well, we tend to base it on Rust just because our contract programming is so unfamiliar, we want to at least make an entry easy for some audience. And because we're similar to Rust in terms of having this borrow checker, which is quite hard to learn, we made the syntax similar to Rust in many cases. In some cases, we diverge from Rust syntax on purpose, and we do that exactly when this feature works differently and move in Rust as sort of an indicator to the programmer that, hey, you know, you're in a different world here. Don't like, don't get into the Rust mindset. Like, the, you need to think differently about this because it works differently to move. We care a lot about making it easy to learn as a Rust programmer and then as a Solidity programmer or someone coming from an existing smart contract track background. So we make it at least similar syntax wise and then in many aspects design wise to Rust. Roger that. So what we also haven't have seen from our lovely community is the idea that Move is somehow less flexible than Solidity. So why was this specific language chosen for our blockchain? Maybe Demir, you can answer this part of the question. I wouldn't say it's less flexible. There's just like, there are a few things that the Solidity allows people to do, I mean, in EVM, such as like just dynamic dispatch. I mean, everything falls into this huge category, which is dynamic dispatch. That gives people like flexibility to, for example, publish contracts or like access something that doesn't exist, relying or like expecting that it behaves in some way. I mean, like you can make a call to some address and expect it to behave like you would expect, but this address doesn't exist yet, for example, or it implements something else. And we don't have anything like this in Move. Because Move aims to eliminate, I mean, to be statically verifiable and to prevent all possible errors on the compilation stage. So you can't rely on something happening in the blockchain. I mean, that something will be on the blockchain later on. I mean, that's by design is impossible. And everything should happen on the compilation stage. So you will know for sure, which would mean that it is secure, that if you compiled your code and if it was like successfully published, we will also run like bytecode verification and stuff, that when you published it, it's guaranteed to be secure. So there is nothing that can happen, like re-entrancy or anything else. So less flexible in that sense, yes, maybe. More secure in response, of course. If I can chime in with one thing on that, I mean, I might be nitpicking terminology here, but I think expressive is definitely good. I don't think flexible in a language is necessarily good, especially in a security critical demand like smart contracts. Flexibility can open up the door for vulnerabilities and attacks. And we all know like this is a huge problem in the smart contract space. And I think EVM definitely errs on the side of introducing flexibility that's not needed to encode certain use cases, but opens the door for vulnerabilities that are really nasty and really subtle, like rear invention state related vulnerabilities. So in Move, what we aim to do is be just as expressive and solidity. And as the EVM is and in fact, more expressive, but maybe less flexible in the sense that there's one way to do something instead of multiple ways. And the one way to do it is safe instead of potentially scary and vulnerability introducing. Fair. So the question itself, word for word, is how can the project, which is based on Move, cooperate with a project which built on EVM? So my understanding and work with me and my lovely, lovely dev team is, uh, so how can projects based on Move cooperate with those that were built on EVM? Or you can add what, or, or go, go, go for it. Yeah, I can go first and you can add on to it maybe. So I can mention some projects we're working on uh, related to move and EVM interop. So right now we're actually working with Salo, which is an EVM based blockchain to bring move VM onto their chain as well. So that means the goal of this project is to have both move VM and EVM supported on the Salo blockchain. So you can write either Solidity or move contracts or even both and publish them on Salo and interop with both of them. We also hope to incorporate some sort of communication between the two VMs. So we're designing that communication protocol pretty carefully to make sure that all the nice features like the safety guarantees of Move are still preserved during this communication. So stay tuned for that project. And another project I want to mention uh, is the Move to EVM compiler, which the Move team and Meta worked on at the beginning of this year. I also helped contribute to that. So what that does is that you can write some code and it compiles 
to EVM bytecode for you. That means you can write move code and publish it on an EVM-based blockchain using this compiler. So we have actually built pretty good dev eggs around that compiler. The move team at Meta added a move plugin to Hardhat, which is like a development kit for a Solidity contract. So this way you can write and test your move code using Hardhat, just like how you write and test your Solidity code. You can even use the same set of test cases for both by contrasting both languages. So I feel like that product has a pretty big potential for helping with like communication between a move and EVM. And I think it can also maybe be used to adapt some tools that only work for EVM to also work for move by code. I mean, you want to drop it? I can imagine, I mean, perhaps there is, but that in most of the cases, you, you just don't need to use move and, and so easily. There's usually no application, except probably for Salo, where you need both languages. I mean, you might compile one to another, but I mean, in terms of like interacting between two applications, I mean, like one Z app or something in another and Solidity, you will usually have a bridge. This bridge will have some implementation, so, and usually it doesn't matter like which language is used on either of sides. Question is a bit tricky. <laughs> I think the community likes to throw curveballs to challenge you guys, which is not a bad thing, to be fair. We also have another one that we know is coming up quite a bit. I do think this is an unavoidable one. So Sam, I'll throw this to you. But what are the advantages and disadvantages of SWE and Aptos? Yeah, so let's talk about this specifically with regards to move more broadly in previous MAs. We actually just released a post about the differences between the usage of Move and Aptos and other DM style platforms uh, versus how we're using it in Suite on Tuesday. Maybe someone can drop that out of the event chat or I'll drop the link shortly afterward. Uh, it has some very detailed examples that will go deeper than I'm going to go here, but let me cover some higher level bits. Okay, so Move is this embedded language where there's the core language that's very unopinionated, as I described earlier. And then because it's cross platform, when you integrate it into a specific platform, you're going to then inject your platform specific details, like your transaction format, your storage, and these sorts of things. And then we build DM, we're building Move alongside it. And we have designed it for all the things that DM wanted to do is this permission platform where you really needed account creation to be quite restricted and you need to make sure that folks can't get resources and objects if they don't want them. Whereas where you're in an open blockchain platform, uh, usually like anybody creating an account is easy. You just send money to an account and let it exist. And, you know, anyone can send you an NFT or whatever you want and things can just flow freely across these accounts. So in DM, it didn't work this way. Someone can't just send you money. First, someone has to explicitly create an account on your behalf and then send you money and then you can use that account. Similarly, because of the way the storage was organized, which was based on these DM requirements, you can't get a value of a certain type unless you've sent a transaction to explicitly opt in to receive that thing. So say someone's got a board ape and they want to send it to you, they can't just do that. You have to say, send a transaction that says, yes, look, here's a little holder that holds board apes. I'm ready to receive them. Please send me. You do that. And then the person can go and send them along. Enterprise and product applications want to build things on Suite. For onboarding, they want to mass drop NFTs to users as sort of a growth hack. Here's your address. You don't have an account yet. We drop that if they do, you can see it, it's yours on the Explorer, and then you can play the game and create an account later when it's convenient. This sort of thing isn't possible in the DM style integration of Move because of this requirement that you need to explicitly create an account first and then opt in to receiving that particular asset type. But there are two steps in order to do that. We actually knew this when working on DM itself. We wanted to do this money orders based application where we wanted to mass drop these money orders. We found that actually wasn't possible because of these handcuffs that we put on ourselves because of the other restrictions of DM. So in building Sui Move, we really didn't want that. And so we took a look at like, why wasn't this possible in DM? And it was because because we said the global storage is it has these keys that are a combination of an address and a type. So this means that a particular account can only hold one object of a given type and that you have to opt in to receiving that type before doing it. And so in SWE, we instead organize things around objects that have globally unique IDs. And this means that you can just transfer an object to anyone, even if they haven't created an account yet. And an account can hold an arbitrary number of objects of a given type because they're keyed by ID, not by type. This is no longer a problem. And then we found as we went deeper into this design idea that this just makes a lot of things easier. It makes it easier to implement assets because you don't have to and roll the logic for transfer. If you want to implement an asset that can be transferred in Suite, this is super, super easy. You just add the storability to your asset. There are a lot of things when we talk to game developers and product developers, there's a lot of things you want to do in creating associations between different assets or NFTs. Maybe you have a hero character in a game and they're supposed to have an inventory that has a sword and a shield and some boots. So if you know up front everything that they're going to have in their inventory, then that's no problem. You just add these types of shields to the hero. But if you want a more sort of open system where people can create new accessories after the fact and add them, it's 
really, really hard to do that in the DM style of move, basically because there are no heterogeneous collection. If you have a vector, you have to say, here's all the types in the vector. And if someone is going to create an accessory type, you don't anticipate like a shield when you only thought about a sword, then they won't be able to do that. The vector can only hold swords. So in Swim Move, we've created, we're object centric and we've created this notion of parent-child object association. This is a really natural way to do this sort of accessorizing. The character can be a parent object and then the accessories can be child objects that are added after the fact. There's no type requirements on the child objects. You can add any types there. So it's very easy to have a heterogeneous collection of accessories that have no type relationship to each other. Write code that takes them to the hero on their sword if it's a fighting game or, you know, maybe takes them to the hero on their kitten if it's more of a, a tender game where the hero is playing with their pets. And we think that sort of thing is very, very important, both for realizing some of the promise of what folks want to do with blockchain, which is having like permissionless sort of like extendable games where lots of folks can collaborate to build the same thing. And then also just to like make it easy to write this kind of code. So this has touched on a bunch of different sort of like small things, but I really encourage you to take a look at the post. Uh, we go deep on both the, the techno language aspects of why we did this and the sort of use cases that enable and why they're difficult or impossible to do in the old damn style of move. Got it. And I think one additional thing that we know is these comparisons, whether it is SWE and Aptos or, you know, any other company like layer one blockchain out there, it, it is unavoidable. This is a question that's going to pop up in the industry. You know, for us as a team, you know, we are focusing on our efforts and there is mutual respect between the teams. So at the very least to the community, what I would also like to heavily emphasize is to always treat our competitors with respect because you'll notice from within the organization, everyone is trying their hardest and they really do believe in what they're building so the efforts will play out and we'll see you know where the chips will fall but what i highly encourage um, to all our listeners is to really just respect and you know treat everyone with that intention so that we can all have an environment where everyone can just put their best foot forward so just putting that out there for the intents of, of everyone listening in on to the next question you know what are your thoughts on closed source smart contracts and will SWE allow the published packages to be closed source in this case Adam, would you like to jump into this question? Sure. You know, people might have different opinions on this. It's a, I think it's a more of a philosophical question. And I, I don't want to spend too much time on it, especially because we have a few more questions coming after that. But I think that closed source is like kind of goes against the spirit of what the blockchain platforms try to achieve. I mean, it's the same with Sui. I mean, as a user of a blockchain, would you really like to like send money to be handled by a smart contract that you don't know what it does, right? I'm not sure this is like the best strategy for the users. And I don't think we do plan to allow publishing packages a sort of in a close to us kind of fashion. And in fact, again, hopefully I'm not going against the grade here, but I think we kind of do the opposite. We, we want to encourage code sharing. And, you know, there are these projects that are happening within the community and will kind of make this easier. Like there's this movie project that is basically, it's a repository of code that you will be able to browse and kind of pick things that, you know, may work for your particular application. And of course, there's this notion that I already mentioned, which is to, you know, code is published. And obviously that's true for all blockchains on chain. And so you will be able to reuse whatever other people publish if you obviously trust their code and how would you trust their code if you didn't know what it was right so we still need a mechanism and it's kind of in the works of being able to kind of reliably match the code that's stored on chain with the source code that's called that's, called, that's uh that's sort of off chain and then, you know there will be kind of sooner or later and again this is all in the spirit of kind of facilitating sharing rather than prohibiting it and supporting closed source development but please guys jump in if you disagree or i missed something or if it's represented something I want to add one particular thing we're doing in the tool chain to encourage this. Like, of course, you can't stop someone from publishing a smart contract without source code. You know, you can smart blockchains, including SWE, are permissionless. You can publish whatever you want. But in the SWE stay alive from publishing, something we're working on is making sure your code can only get published if it pre verifies the source code of all of its dependencies. In order to build the code locally, you already need the source code of all your dependencies. This is how the, the compiler works. And so something the tool chain can do is when you publish your code, you look at the source code for each dependency. The way the manifest file works is that it'll have the package ID of that source code on chain. The tool chain can check, okay, I'll go and look at the bytecode published on chain. I'll make sure it matches the source code that I've been building and testing against locally. And it can do that for each such dependency to make sure that your code is trusted. And then of course, when you publish your package, the source code will get uploaded to Movie. This is the new crates.io or NPM like uh, package repository for Move that the, the community has been working on. And that's going to be available for other folks to do the same. So basically the tool chain just makes it hard, not impossible. You could hack around it and do it your own way, but it makes it very, very hard to depend on code that's not open source. And so I think we think that's really going to encourage having open source code for all of your smart contracts, which is super important for a healthy ecosystem. If I may add one more thing, the notion of closed source may have a double meaning. In fact, whatever you publish on the chain that supports the multiple language, the bytecode, it's not really closed source because you can always inspect the bytecode, right? So you kind of can figure out what the code does. 
because it would just not be represented as if, you know, the source code that the developer originally wrote, but you still have the ability to inspect it. And there is currently no way to kind of obfuscate it to the point where you cannot understand what the code is doing at all. And are there any specific core changes that need to be addressed in the future for the Move VM? Maybe Todd, you have some thoughts on this. We've been doing AI that Sam highlighted in his uh, the, this recent kind of blog post about why we built 3Move. We do have like a new storage layer and we have a new way of interacting with storage in Move. But we've been able to achieve that with, you know, native functions and the ability to kind of add new native functionality without adding new bytecode operations. And so we've been pretty successful with doing that and kind of running our own set of verification checks on top of the normal verification checks that the VM does for Move bytecode. That being said, some of this isn't super ergonomic. We're sort of like pulling some hacks to get some of these things to work, you know, maybe around abilities. We sort of have this pattern or idea for Move development as it goes to the core language that things are sort of tested out in individual, you know, instantiations of Move on individual blockchains. And then it's like, yeah, this is a really great idea. We think it'd be good for all deployments of Move. We could kind of like pull it in to the core language. So I see like an extension to the ability system kind of coming in to make some of the extensions we've done for we move a bit more first class. So I think that's kind of like one category of things. There's also just like a change or with the, you know, there's like a downstream set of things just as like move as a whole of, hey, you know, it'd be great if we had tuple, it'd be great if we had enums or, you know, XYZ feature would be cool to have. And these are also changes that would be needed in the core language or the VM. And these are always things we're thinking about. And I, I think that no one on the move side of things really has had a lot of time to add new things like this for quite some time. Just not, we've all been kind of gearing, you know, get some deployment of move on our respective blockchains out into the wild. So I think these sort of more classical things that you're used to when you think about like new language features or new VM features, those are probably be a, a little bit of a ways off, uh, but we're thinking about it. If I were to have zero experience in programming, which I absolutely do, I often joke that I'm the golden retriever if you compare myself to the engineering team. Can Move actually be the first language that I learn? Can they, please? Yes, Demir. Let this golden retriever know, can she learn Move as the first so, language? The answer is very unfortunate because, no. I mean, I mean, technically you can start coding with Move. You can like take any of the books that exist for they're in move and then you like publish your smart contract but the limitations of that will be that you will only be able to interact with your smart contract or like module on the network and so i mean you, you can implement your coin and then like to publish and i mean the publish then burn it mint it transfer and that's it and so you will be limited by the lack of automation and complexity of the ways how you call the smart contracts or like your move modules or the apps, if we call them. For me, it was also like a bootstrap for Rust because Move's borrow checker, as it was already mentioned, like copy is Rust borrow checker. And so I was learning Move and I was like, oh, that's how it is in Rust. So it might be a nice something to learn programming, but to actually ship something to have a full size, full fledged D app, you need to learn the tooling as well. And tooling can be different. Like it can be JavaScript, we're implementing SDK for it. It can be possibly Python if someone ever implements a Python library, or it can be Rust. We're also working on Rust SDK for it. So the short answer, it's nice to learn move. It's nice to see someone working, but you will always need a second language, which will be like more general purpose language to tool it and to really ship something that is complicated enough to get people's attention. Otherwise you're going to stick to like, okay, my coin is there. It's really hard to use it because I need to type all these dead parameters and arguments in CLI. That's not how people usually use the apps. You want something to be on the website. You can click on it and it interests like transaction and stuff. So yeah. And continue with the theme of golden retriever wants to learn language. It sounds like I have to be multilingual. So are there tips in getting started to uh, become better in terms of the requirements to make this applicable for someone like myself? I think we're working on that because right now, I mean, our SDK is just still ongoing, but we will eventually start publishing. We will soon start showing how to build the app with small knowledge or like little knowledge of JavaScript, how to do something that it works and also automated, like how to do deploys, like, I mean, automated publishes. We're slowly going into this direction. 
Awesome. Actually, Demir, this makes me think maybe we should create a golden retriever non-technical learning stack. And we can even have my team be like the first pilot case to show like all the pitfalls if you have zero background in this region. Just so that we can make it a little less scary because I know that there are people who are deeply interested like myself, but just literally have nowhere to start because we have none of this background, right? So definitely we'll work with you and the wider team on what that might look like because I imagine we're going to get a lot of questions like this as we continue and deploy more things that are exciting in the space. So basically more work for both of us. It's going to be fantastic. Yeah, small note. I saw some people on Discord mentioning that the best way to like start the first step is to read the move book, like which is move-book.com because I was a for people who don't have smart contract knowledge. And so it's like step-by-step, step, the dumbest, the uh, lots of words, it's not called the prolific, but for some people it works. And then you can jump into like the official documentation of the official notebook and also to Swing Docs. We also have nice Swing Docs, which kind of show how to get started with Swing Move. And I think it's pretty also prolific. There are lots of words and lots of explanations. So it's a nice way to start with Swing Move. So how should we understand move assets and what sets them apart from assets? For example, you know, Ethereum style assets. Um, I think maybe Emma, you can have some deep thoughts on this one because we know that this is also popping up. So I think this is asking about like Sway Move's asset model compared to say Ethereum or Solidity's Solid um, asset model. They're also pretty new to Sway Move, but I'll get my like first impression of it. I feel like it is more intuitive. It's like closer to what we have in the physical world, right? In the physical world, you have like a pen, a cup, a few coins in your wallet. That's exactly how it works in Sway Move too. When you say you have like 10 straight tokens, what it means is that you have like a straight coin token that has the value 10 under your address and that's it. But how is it represented, say, Ethereum, right? Normally, when you say you have like a 10 ERC20 tokens of some sort, normally it means that in a contract written by someone else, there's a mapping called balances. And in that mapping, there is an entry for you that has the value 10. So you see how it is less intuitive than our model. And you also don't really truly own that asset. It's just like evaluating someone else's contract. So I feel like that's one kind of advantage. Another thing is that this model really helps us with scalability of the blockchain. I think Sam can chime in later, but like I'll just explain what I feel. So in the same move, if you are say transferring two objects and they are not independent and they can happen at the same time because they are like separate objects. But in solidity, if you want to ERC20 token transfer, they cannot happen at the same time. They had to be executed sequentially because they will touch the same contract state. I think in certain move we have a potential for better scalability because of our object model. And what are your thoughts on modules in SWE being immutable after being published? You know, immutability means we don't have to trust the developers, but you know, there's sometimes bugs that get reported that could be fixed if the module itself is mutable. Maybe Todd, you have some thoughts on this one. It's funny because immutability I means you do have to trust the developers like a lot that they got it right. I think the question is trying to say you have to trust that you do not have to trust them that they're going to like, you know, pull a rug out from under you and change the code to do something malicious. Yeah, I think that's yeah. the case. Yeah. You know, we've been thinking about this a bit and it's a choking problem, right? Because it's a double edge and I think the, the person asking this fully understands it, that, you know, there's this double edge sort of you can fix bugs, but you can also introduce them. We're still kind of thinking about it and there's a lot of different layers. At some point, we want to have some version of versioning of packages on Sweet. But in to get there, we have to first kind of figure out, okay, what does it mean for modules to be versioned in Move? as a, you know, as the base layer of the language. Is that something we want in the base layer? Or do we have to make this a SWE specific addition to move? Like our object model was for us a SWE specific thing. We're thinking right now that we want some version of versioning of modules to be in the core language because it's something that's going to appear on every blockchain instantiation of move or usage of move. We're still trying to figure out the right way of getting that to work. I think at the end of the day, you're always going to have some version of, you know, a new version number means more or less creating a new package. When you publish a new version of the package, we can't just delete the old version. Which, you know, something that we could do is say, hey, I trust this developer, so I'll take any version of their package. Just give me the most recent version. So you can imagine having a system where you publish a package and you update the major version number from like three to four and all the other code that was linking to it, if they had trusted that developer, they can sort of say, yep, I'm automatically getting the new version. But you can also imagine someone saying, oh, I'm 
very fussy. I want to approve any changes and I want to make sure that, you know, when I see a new version of this module or package come out, I want to make sure I'm opting into that. Imagine instead that their package is fixing the version of its dependencies. So I'm fixed the version three of my dependency and that I will make an update to then bump the version of my dependency up to the next version. So that's kind of like the scheme we're thinking about getting there and getting to that will take some time and it's just difficult, but that's the sort of framework we're thinking within. Nothing right now. You can sort of mock this, at least um, you can mock the fussy version of this, you know, in the language already just by publishing a new package, but you know, it's obviously a flat rate. And another question that we kind of get, and I think Sam, you might want to answer this one is why didn't meta license move? This is a good question. I mean, so for programming languages, licensing almost never makes sense because the biggest asset a language can have is its community. And if you put any barriers on using the language, like licensing, like trying to keep it closed source and sell it, then that makes it harder. And Meta does open source very well, so they understand this. They go to other languages, they put up popular frameworks like React that uh, you know came out of Meta, but are now easy ubiquitously across many, many cases. And so with Move is very much the same. Like they and we understand how this works, and like we wouldn't want it to work on a language that was closed sourced or was licensed. And so from the beginning, we were very interested in making this open. And as we mentioned before, not making it overfitted to a single platform like DM, but making it so this is really a language for everybody who's writing code for blockchain, uh, who's running safe smart contracts, who's writing code that manipulates scarce assets that and using these abstractions that other languages don't have. Like programming language work is so much fun that uh, people will do it for free. And so this is why languages work at all, because there's just like so many people who love doing this sort of thing that they'll pick it up and do it as a hobby, do it in their spare time, that it'll eventually become a thing. It doesn't always have a corporate backer. Like Rust began this way as a side project of Green and Horror, something that he was doing in his spare time, or JavaScript began, sorry, JavaScript is a different case, but PHP also began this way, you know, somebody playing around with a scripts to publish on a web page and then turn into a language that everyone uses. So this is something that I really love about language, that they're fundamentally free and open, and that's what gives them more value. It's not the typical, like, how do we make money off of this kind of setup? It's like, how can we get as many people loving this and using it and building a community as possible? So the move is no different. That, uh, we're, we're very glad about that. But I also think this kind of goes into some of the other previous questions about open source, moving the programming language forward. I don't think it's wise for anyone within this industry, as particularly within, you know, source code or byte code stuff to make it closed and license it because the whole point is adoption and to make sure that there's enough programmers who are building into the space to keep progressing and moving it forward. Was that part of the intention for Meta and any other like large Web2 traditional tech company as they potentially explore avenues of getting into Web3 as well. Yeah, I think that's right. Like when the Libra project began, Meta already, I think, had this philosophy for open source specifically, but I think in the Web3 space, like the ethos is collaborative, it's open, it's permissionless. So that has to be part of everything that you do, including engineering, how you license things, how you present them. So I think they were very much thinking about that, just as we are. And then I think we have our final question where we are going to go through the additional ones on our event chat. But in terms of the ones that we had collected previous to this AMA, the last one is, can I start building my dApp on testnet and will it be useful for the sweet community? Can I? Yes. Ding, ding, ding. This is yours. Please build on testnet. You can even start building on testnet because you have unique trends because, I mean, we're going to ship the project soon enough. And so the sooner you start building, the sooner you start like getting a hold of how system works and how it performs and how to, to work with it. The more experience you'll get yourself, the more chances that you'll pass all the testing stages by the time that we hit mainnet. And also you will get the unique perspective on, on how things are built and you can help us build the community and help other developers developers build everything on Sweet. I myself am building like few projects which are top secret for now, but I can say for sure that the state of the network is enough. I mean, I say it as a smart contract developer in the past, the state of the network on DevNet is enough to really build something valuable on Reddit. And I've never seen anything like that. I'm now saying it as a like side DF developer who doesn't really interact with the core team and not as a member of the team. Are there other yeah. things that you might be able to tease to the audience of what you're building? Because you said it's like deeply under wraps. Yeah, it is deeply under wraps. Last point for testnet. Okay, guys, just know that something is brewing within the team. And I thought I could get it out of Demir, but he's keeping his cards tight to his chest. So as we draw closer, you can expect some lovely surprises to be dropped. I can say, so sorry for interrupting you, that's the last thing I'm going to add. If you have ideas and you like trying to see if it works out, I think we could manage somehow on our side. I mean, if you have a project that you need us to review or like help you guide in some direction, please text in the Movelang channel and we'll do it. 
But that was a fantastic segue, I think, into some of the other questions that we've received. I think we have maybe an extra five minutes. I don't know if you do have to jump into other calls, but hopefully you can spare a little bit of time because our chat has been quite active in the last hour that you've all been speaking. But let's see if I can go through these questions quickly. And if there are some that I know, you know, Sam and a few others have been active in the events chat as well. So if there are particular questions that kind of ping your eye, like, please let me know or jump straight into answering them. One of the first ones I saw is, I'd like to know about the current research efforts on verification with MOVE. What are some of the things that you are working on right now in regards to verification? So probably the ML is talking about has been originally developed for what we call the core MOVE, which is the MOVE flavor that has been used with the M framework. It will take a little bit of time to adopt it to work with other MOVE flavors. And the reason for it is that in order for the prover to work, it has to understand sort of all the intricacies of the language uh, semantics of the behavior of the specific remove flavor to be able to, you know, analyze the code and make certain claims about it. So at this point, we have the prover is integrated in the sense that you can run prover on the three flavor of move and it will run correctly. But if you try to start specifying the specs as they're called, which is the annotations that are needed for verifying actual properties, this will not always work because again, this adoption of the internals of the prover to the other move language flavors uh, is not complete. So the first sort of thanks is to finish that adoption. And Emma and I will work on this very shortly. Actually, we started already. And then we will try to give examples of how you can write annotations or the specs for your own code. But we will also attempt to formal verification of our framework, of the Swing framework code. So that's kind of the plan. I can't really, I don't want to talk about the timeline, but again, we already started working on this. So you can expect some updates, hopefully in a fairly short time frame. I want to add a little bit more details on that. So the reason why we have to adapt move prover is because move prover was really built for a point and we kind of like overfit it to the DM global storage model, which is different from Swift's like global storage model. And therefore we had to like do this modeling of global storage, of Swift global storage again, and plug that into the move prover. And that's what we're designing right now. And because it difference is only in global storage right now, our Swift will prove command should work for simple those conditions and abort conditions, but it won't allow you to specify anything about our object storage. That will be coming hopefully soon. Yeah. We're also seeing, you know, where is that sold to move transpiler? As a non-technical, I will be honest, I don't know what that question means. So if someone can jump in on that one, that would be really helpful. The compiler is the opposite. So it's moved to UL, which then compiles down to the, uh, the EPM. You're not writing Solidity code into move. And it's Solar Send who actually put that question. So we can reply directly so that other people on the event chat can see the Solidity to move transpiler question plus our answer and a resource to it. I also see a question on, will there be videos on how to code on move? So I can actually help answer this one, surprisingly. Ha <laughs> ha, I know. We are working with our lovely head of DevRel, Brian, who will help us create an overview of how we want to create tutorials and onboarding for the Move programming language with Ben, who also oversees. He's our product program slash engineer manager on Move. And between the three of them, as well as working closely with everyone on this call, we're going to create different modules and, you know, beginner, advanced, intermediate, you know, tracks, if you will, with visual, video, GIF, different types of content to help with that onboarding. We do recognize recognize that some people just work better with video and not purely through, you know, written documentation. So we're being mindful of that recording, but it's just making sure that we are structuring that tutorial session in a way that makes sense and is accessible for everybody. So stay tuned. We don't have hard dates on that yet, but know that we have teams that are building out that project as we speak. And I think that has been most of the questions, unless there's additional things that, you know, people on this call, our lovely speakers would like to continue extending on. Any takers? Fun facts? We need to the story about the empty trip from the beginning. And I mean, it's not much of a story other than like we suck. Is that a story? Yes, because failure is a fantastic <laughs> learning. Precisely. And a move has this uh, static type system. And do you have this ability of, you know, sort of deserializing values? And especially with generics, you have the ability to like create these very large instantiations of types. So you can say, I have like a foo of a foo of a, or like a cup of a cup of a cup of a tea, or uh, maybe a better example is like a vector, you know, you have U8, or you can have a vector of U8. 
Or you could have a vector of a vector of u8, or a vector of a vector of a vector of u8, and so on. This becomes a little tricky in terms of the deserialization and serialization story around move values. Those values don't actually contain any data, and they're just type wrappers. As a result, we can sort of just like kick the can down the road of like, oh, yeah, that's a tricky problem. Can't wait to solve that someday. And we just require every move struct has to contain at least some data. So if you're in the source language and you write struct my struct, and you say, you know, left curly, right curly. The compiler is going to tell you, yeah, that's just fine. But under the hood, it's actually inserting a field, a single Boolean field into that struct. So all, you know, struct values contain at least some data. And this sort of makes the serialization, deserialization story a little bit easier. You can't accidentally create these sort of infinite depth types that have no data underneath them. It's not much of a, as I was saying, like theoretically, it should be possible. We just then do it because it's hard. And when we have a limited time, so here we are. One thing that's definitely true about Move, where the basics are there and they're barely solved and they're great, but of course, like with anything, the most exciting direction is what can be out of the future. We have a long, long list of features that we're super interested to add. Things, Todd mentioned some earlier things like Enums, which would be useful in a number of contexts, things like using the global storage in different ways, things like supporting objects in the prover. So we're very excited to get out into mainnet so that we can then really focus on going back into the language and improving even further, and also hearing like what folks are doing and using that feedback to drive uh, the things we're going to prioritize. Next. You might actually hear me say this sometimes in the group, and it's in private, but I'll probably be a bit more public about it, which is it's the trash panda philosophy. So I often call myself a trash panda in addition to golden retriever, lots of animal metaphors that I use, but trash pandas were efficient, which means aka we're lazy. So when Todd was speaking about, yeah, you know, we, we just didn't do it. It's like, yes, trash panda philosophy. So there's no harm. There's no bad things in following that. I think we do have to be a bit ruthless about what we're editing and what we're prioritizing and focusing our efforts. So yeah, that was my little mini contribution to this discussion. Is there anything else that you wanted to kind of close with? Fun, I think we already did fun facts actually, but little nuggets that you want people in the community to be mindful of as we prepare and get the road ready for testnet launch. I think the only thing I'll say is in our incentivized test that post, we announced that we're doing this series of move challenges with each wave of incentivized test that we call these uh, the swim challenge. We'll soon be releasing the details of the first such challenge and uh, it may be related to the, the secret that the mirror is keeping tightly under wraps. We really hope a lot of the folks will think here will jump in and try out this challenge. We're going to have great prizes. We're going to have interesting example code to build on and ideas of projects to build. So we really hope uh, we can see some quality contributions and uh, folks trying out the bun suite. Adam, Demir, Emma, Todd, any other final words before we close this grand AMA session out? More move developers. We'll have more workshops too, though, to get those move developers to join. Should we tease it, Demir, that we, we're thinking of doing a move workshop no, next month? No, I mean, I mean, we could do it. Yeah, you could. Yeah. Why don't you tease it? Because last time you didn't even drop any hint. Well, you kind of did in the chat. But what's, what's that hint or actually the blatant announcement on what's happening next month? Please do tell the community. I don't know. You were telling me because I didn't know what you were talking about and, and I'm serious. Oh, <laughs> this is this is where you get to see a live action of like disconnect happening in real time. So <laughs> let me elaborate. Actually, it's uh, next month. We will have a move workshop that's happening in Korea. Oh, was this one? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Uh, in Seoul, we'll, we'll be there prior to blockchain week. So we will anticipate doing our first ever workshop in person, but we'll also record it and share it so that people who cannot attend, obviously it, it's quite limited, but our goal is to make that also accessible outside. So we're really excited to get these series on the road. I know that people are asking about additional move resources. So understand that we're working through various programs, not just recordings and tutorials, but also looking to do hands-on workshops directly with our teams, people like Demir and Todd and Adam and Emma. And yes, Sam, you'll be roped into these things as well. And also a huge thing to everyone who's doing content about Move because we see a lot of like resources, books, articles, and everything. And we're super, super grateful for that because it's really hard to cover all these topics. We don't know Move. I mean, how, how Move behaves. We, we discover new patterns. We discover new something. And we just can't cover everything. And Move is something that is fun to explore even to this day and will be even more because as soon as we add new features to the language, we don't know yet how to use them and like how to find them use cases. And it's also fun to do it yourself because sometimes people can bring new ideas and like new perspective on what we can achieve with the language. That's super important. 
This actually gives us an idea of how we can create a creator dev contribution program. So we'll definitely add that actually onto the docket because yes, we've had some excellent contributions from everyone who've enriched a lot of the work that the team had already done and given us new perspectives. And we really want to acknowledge that contribution as well. Adam, Emma, Todd, Sam, any final parting words before we close this out? No, I don't think so. Thanks so much, Jen, for moderating up Fantastic Job as usual. And thanks to everyone who listened in. Uh, we really appreciate you all. Yep. Thank you for the great questions. And that uh, was fun. So thanks a lot. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. In that case, have a great day. Good night. Good morning. Good afternoon. And we will hold another AMA session next week. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your time.